Greetings and welcome back to Patriot to the Core podcast. Today we have author and veteran Will Bardenwerper, and I really was intrigued by his book called The Prisoner in His Palace. And it's about the uh, 12 Americans who kind of guarded him during his trial. And uh, it really goes into show, it shows two Saddams coexisting in one person. Uh, you have the defiant tyrant who uses torture and murder as tools and a shrewd but contemplative prisoner who exhibits surprising affection and dignity you know, in the face of looming death. So in no way does this book uh, praise Saddam Hussein um, but it because he, he does not skip the fact of what a an evil man he was really and his, and his sons as well and uh, it's just it's a very interesting book uh, Will is also um, a great patriot this is a guy who was working in Midtown Manhattan when the attacks of 9-11 happened he had a degree from Princeton and uh, he was working in finance and so he ended up joining the army he quit his job right after the attacks, and then it took a little while to get into the military, but he ended up going Army, and he became an infantry officer. And so have a great talk with him about his career and then also about the book. So I think you'll enjoy learning some things about Saddam that you may not have known. All right, so Will, I wanted to talk first of all about about you and your military career and why you joined the Army, because it seems like I read that, you know, 9-11 had something to do with it, and I'm not sure now. I think you were working in finance, but would you just give us some background on what motivated you to to, to, to fight the enemy? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, you're right. I uh, I was working in finance in Manhattan. Um, I had been living there for about three years when uh, September 11, 2001 rolled around. Um, I was in Midtown at the time, so we weren't in any uh, immediate danger, but... Um, you know, I lived not too far from from uh, you know downtown uh, where the the attack occurred, and um, and yeah, that really was the catalyst for me to step back and kind of think through what it was that I was doing in life, and if there were opportunities for me to maybe uh, uh, contribute a little more to 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 our society. And, and at the time, I honestly didn't uh, even know it was going to be the military. Um, I did know that that finance was not. Uh, at the time, you know, something that I was going to probably find satisfying in the light of everything that happened. Uh, but it, I wasn't sure if I was going to go in the direction of, you know, maybe law enforcement, the NYPD, the FBI, the CIA, the, the military. Um, so I quit my job about a week later. Uh, in retrospect, maybe a little prematurely because I didn't know what the next step was. I just had a very general idea. And uh, the more I looked into it, the more I determined that the, the military was probably the way to go. And I kind of narrowed it down to the Marines and the Army. And uh, it turns out the Army could have uh, could take me a little more quickly. Um, and, uh, you know, rather than wait a year to join the Marines at, at the time, I was unemployed because I had already quit my job. Uh, I decided, you know what, let's, let's do the Army. Um, so I uh, went to the recruiting office, uh, signed up. And before I knew it, I was at basic training. So when did you join? So I, I, it was a while. I, I quit my job in you know a week after September 11th, and I didn't actually begin basic training for almost a year, um, and that was just because it took me a little while to figure out what it was that I wanted to do. And then once I made that determination, it took the military, um, you know, like any bureaucracy, a while to uh, you know get me a slot and, and get me down there. So it was a little bit of a delay. I, I kind of made ends meet in the meantime, doing some work as a uh, in a bar, doing some construction work, um, you know, just trying to, to make a little money, um, you know, to, to, to help me, uh, uh, you know, get through until uh, until it became time to, to, to get down to basic training. Okay. So I'm wondering now, like, kind of where were you at in your life? I guess you weren't married at that time? No, I was I was single. Um, I was, let's see, I would have been about 20, you know, six years old. Um, you know, I was a Princeton graduate li- living in Manhattan, working in finance, like a lot of other classmates from my school were doing at the time. Um, and I didn't dislike my job. I actually, you know, I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed living in the city. I, I was content. Um, but I think what happened was those attacks kind of just opened up my eyes to um, – you know, events and issues that were more important than, uh, you know, messing around with Excel spreadsheets and, and trying to make a lot of money. It it, it kind of just opened my eyes up to, to service. And it reminded me a little bit of, 
my grandparents and the greatest generation and the sacrifices that they had made uh, for our country um, and kind of just uh, was the spark for me to, 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 to try to make the same kind of a decision. So how did this come about? I mean, when it happened, did you immediately have that desire to do something or did it kind of come about over the next few days? Yeah, the, um, that's a that's a good question. It, 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 no, it wasn't immediate. I mean, it wasn't like I, I mean, like a lot of people, I'll never forget where I was at the time of the attacks. I was sitting in our office was a, a trading floor kind of environment, you know, so lots of sort of cubicles all uh, near each other with with uh, TVs that were tuned into CNBC and the different financial channels. And, you know, like a lot of people, there was that first plane hit and people thought, oh, you know, maybe it was just a small, you know, Cessna or something that got off path. And then pretty much as soon as the second one hit, most people concluded, you know, something that this is an attack. This was planned. It's, it's not a coincidence that two planes would have crashed. Um, but no, it wasn't instantaneous. Um, it wasn't like, oh, my goodness, we've been attacked. I'm going to join the military tomorrow. I think it was more in the ensuing days watching the response of the first responders, watching the policemen, watching the firemen who were down there working, you know, 24 seven in the rubble to, to try to recover, you know, as many people as they could. Um, you know, there's a tremendous sense of, of patriotism. Um, and it sounds funny, you know, uh, you know, now because a lot of people have kind of gone back to their regular lives and that, that sense has diminished a little bit. But, you know, in those days and weeks in, in, uh, Manhattan following the attack, it was a very patriotic time. And, um, you know, I was inspired by that. And, and I knew that, that if I didn't make a decision quickly, it, it would probably, you know, eventually evaporate. So I did want to make a decision sooner rather than later. Yeah, you know, speaking of the patriotism, uh, one of my guests early on was um, Dan Hammond, and he was on the, the first flight from Na Nashville to JFK when they when they uh, opened back up travel. And you know, a few uh -huh. people were on the plane, and he said that when he got to New York, he, you know, people weren't on the streets. You know, people weren't honking at, at each other. It was mm -hmm. everybody was more friendly and understanding. It was just a whole different feeling. Yeah, it, it, it's it's remarkable, and it's it's hard to really explain it. Um, you know, unless you were there, it's it's hard to capture what that felt like. Um, uh, I don't know if you're too familiar with the author Sebastian Younger, who wrote the book Tribe, um, and he talks a little bit about um, you know what it is uh, that that makes people who were in the military in in many instances you know miss their time serving. And he draws a little bit of an analogy to to nine eleven or to Manhattan post nine eleven, and it's kind of just that sense of of uh, you know we're in this together, um, we're we're part of something larger than ourselves, and and um, and his argument is that there's at least a small part of everyone that kind of craves that, um, and and that's why oftentimes or a surprising amount of the time, people look back on moments of crisis with a little bit of, of nostalgia because, because it's not every day in life that you, you do feel that, uh, that bond, that bond with, with your neighbor. Um, and it was definitely there in those, in those days. I, you know, I, I will never forget that. Yeah. And I didn't realize you were a Princeton grad at this time. In fact, that was one of the questions I was going to ask you. So <laughs> it, it makes it even more, I don't know. It's just kind of, uh, standing at, stands out even more that you already had your college degree. Of course, from a well-known um, college, and then you uh, you have a good job, you know things are probably going pretty well for you, and then you you take a a pay cut uh, to join the military and also to live a little more dangerous life. So, I mean, when you decided the army they could take you, you know, what did you did you have any like specific job you wanted to do in the army? Yeah, I I. I decided that if, if I'm going to make this decision to serve, I'd like to push myself as hard as I, as I can and to kind of take myself out of, out of my natural comfort zone. And, you know, having, I took the opportunity to speak to as many current service members as I could to pick their brains and, and learn more about the army. And, and at the time, the Marines, I was researching as well. Um, and I talked to as many veterans as I could, and I just kind of asked them, listen, if I'm going to make this decision, there's a lot of different directions you can go within the military writ large. Um, you know, tell me a little bit about them. And, and through those discussions, uh, you know, a number of people I spoke to suggested that, that if you're going to do the army, you know, traditionally the infantry is kind of the, the, the most challenging, uh, uh, 
uh, you know, specialty that you can have. It's kind of the core mission of the army at the end of the day to, to close with and kill the enemy. Um, and so I thought to myself, you know, if, if the whole point here is that I'm walking away from a desk job to serve my country and, and to do something different, I don't want to replace one desk job with, <laughs> with another desk job. Mm-hmm. So let's go as far in the other extreme as I can, uh, which is why I, I, I chose the infantry as my first, uh, um, you know, branch choice. And luckily enough, I got it and, uh, you know, spent most of the next two years, you know, going through all of the different army schools from basic training to officer candidate school, to infantry training to ranger school, airborne school. Um, you know, so it was almost two years before I actually got to my first duty station. Wow. So, so tell me how this works. This is probably a dumb question, but so you did go in as an officer, it sounds like. Well, it's, yeah, the army, all the branches I think are a little different in that respect. If you do the Marines, you, you can go straight to officer candidate school and then become an officer. The way the army does it or did it, I think they still do it this way, is you, you, you sign a contract that guarantees you a spot at officer candidate school, assuming you successfully graduate basic training, but you have to go to basic training first. Um, so you go to basic training, uh, you know, with predominantly, uh, you know, enlisted folks. Um, but when the enlisted, uh, individuals graduate basic training, they go on to the, their, you know, learn their occupational specialty. You just go straight to, to OCS. Um, okay. so it just adds like one more step to the process. So you were one of the older guys, I guess, in basic training. Oh yeah. I mean, that, that was something like, you know, I look back on it and, and one of the hardest parts was just culturally because, you're, you know, I was a good 10 years older than most of them. And, uh, you know, they'd just be referring to music and movies. And, and I felt like I was back in high school, <laughs> um, you know, so, socially. And, uh, you know, so that was that part of it was as challenging as any of the, you know, the physical parts of it. Yeah, I would think so. I mean, I know my brother was 26 when he enlisted and, uh, uh-huh. and he was, you know, he, he had not, he had also, he graduated college and he had lived away as a missionary. And so it was, he was, probably seemed older than the eight years that he was eight or nine years. He was at most of them, I guess. Uh huh. Yep. So I'm sure he, he went through a lot of those same, those same experiences. So what about your, did I'm, I'm curious how many times you deployed and where you went and was it only, did you just go to the middle East? Um, yeah. So, um, in the army, I deployed only one time. It was a, about a 14 month deployment in 2006, uh, into 2007. Um, I began, I spent the first four or so months up in Talafar, um, in Northern Iraq, which was pretty stable. Um, the current national security advisor, uh, at the time, Colonel McMaster, now, you know, they went on to become a general. He had actually just led a very successful operation cleaning out Talafar. So we were lucky enough to kind of inherit, uh, uh, the security that, that his, uh, uh, brigade had, had, uh, established. Um, about a third of the way through the deployment, though, we were bounced down to Anbar province. Um, uh, saw battalions in uh, Ramadi, uh, my battalion a little to the west of Ramadi in a, in a city called, uh, pronounced Heat, but it's spelled Hit, H-I-T. Um, and that was the exact opposite. Um, that was extremely violent. Uh, it was basically the most violent province in Iraq in the most violent year of the Iraq war. Um, so that was was uh you know a much more challenging uh, mission that that we had down there so that was my only army deployment later as a civilian um i spent some time in africa uh doing some counterterrorism work with the military but that was that was separate okay like a, like a contractor type no it was a government civilian attached to some special operations forces that were doing counterterrorism work in africa well was that how did the danger there compare to iraq uh, it was it was more stable um, in, in the area where we were. Um, Iraq was was uniquely, um, I think, uh, you know, dangerous in my experience just because of the the year that we were there and because of the the, the place where we were. Um, I don't know. You may remember there was a Marine intelligence report that somehow got leaked to the uh, Washington Post, and and the the thesis of the report was that Anbar Province has been lost. Um, you know, there's no hope. Uh, the people will never be receptive to us, and the insurgents basically are on top and are going to stay on top. And at the time, I was there, and I thought to myself, you know what? Like, this isn't far off. You know, I, I was very pessimistic about the the future there. Um, and fortunately, you know, for the short term at least, I, I was wrong. Um, we we were ultimately 
um, pretty successful in, in a lot of ways. Um, those gains, you know, of course, in later years uh, uh, eroded, but but uh, in the short term, um, there was a lot more success than I ever would have imagined. Yeah, so what was it like in 06 and 07? I, it seems like 05 was one of the really bad years in Iraq. Is that right? Yeah, 05 and 06, you know, basically yeah. those years immediately preceding the surge. Um, and we were one of the last units there basically before the surge. And I think, I think that was when things, there was really a sense that things were going in the wrong direction. So you were, uh, an, an, uh, what was it, an infantry officer? Is that right? I was. I was an infantry officer. My job, uh, in HIT was what they call, it essentially was civil affairs. Um, so we, I was, responsible for helping manage my battalion's effort to i mean it sounds silly but kind of do a little bit of everything to establish governments governance to establish um uh you know local security forces to to develop relationships with the local tribes to uh infrastructure work electricity water sanitation i mean basically everything that we associate with a functioning society had fallen into either disrepair or was just non-existent. Um, and the theory was that, you know, if, if that's the case, we'll never succeed um, in, in you know, uh, trying to, you know, improve uh, the quality of life here. So, you know, in a sense, my friends and I would joke, you know, it was like Sim City. You know, you, you, you assign a bunch of 20-year-old infantry officers the, the the task of rebuilding a city of, you know, 100,000 people. Um, so it was it was not easy. Well, what are some things that you learned when you were having to work with the local tribes? Uh, I'm, I'm sure you probably figured out eventually, you know, maybe a, the most effective ways or more effective ways to to communicate and, and maybe get them to, you know, win them to your side, maybe? Yeah, I mean, it it, it was a number of things, um, and I don't take credit for this. I mean, there were a lot of guys smarter than I that, that played a, a more major role in, in that uh, transition, um, you know, one of whom was actually a very good friend of mine who was killed in Ramadi, uh, Travis Patrick Quinn. But so I, I credit guys like him for for that change in philosophy. But I think, you know, to a large extent, it was about being honest. It was about saying, you know, the area where we were, were, were they were never going to love the Americans. They were Sunni Arabs, um, for, you know, 98 percent. Um, they didn't look a lot of them did not look to, at Saddam Hussein as an enemy. They looked at. Saddam is one of their guys, and when we removed Saddam, they were afraid that we had just basically turned the country over to the Shia. Um, and you know, to a large extent, you know, they've been proven right because the Shia now do dominate their government. So we tried to just be honest. We said, "Listen, we understand that you may not love the fact that we're here, but we are. Um, so let's work together to try to make this country as you know peaceful and secure and prosperous for you and for your families and for." your community as we can. So, you know, how do we go about doing that? Um, one way to do that is to recruit you to serve as the security forces because you have a much better idea than we do, um, you know, who belongs here and who doesn't, who has the best interest of your community at heart and who doesn't. Um, so it was an effort to, to um, you know, try to get on the same page. Um, you know, money was obviously part of it uh, to the extent that we could uh, focus reconstruction prog projects uh, strategically, you know, toward their toward their communities, that helped to convince them that 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 we were, uh, you know, sincere in, in our hopes to to help them. Uh, so it was a whole confluence of of different factors, um, and uh, and it wasn't overnight, but but ultimately um, we did have a good deal of success doing that. Did they ever? Did the locals ever do anything, you know, to you and your team that would cause you to not trust them? Or to you know to always keep one eye open. Yeah, I mean that for better or worse, that's kind of just the way things are uh, in that part of the world. Um, uh, and I don't blame them necessarily. I mean we're there temporarily. That they they ultimately are the ones that are going to be living there for the rest of their lives. Um, and so uh, you know they have to be cognizant of that when they're making their decisions. But you know I'll never forget one episode where you know I was kind of young and idealistic, and I, I um, had to ask my brother back home in high school to raise some money to buy school supplies and to buy soccer equipment and athletic equipment that we could distribute to some of the local schools in an effort to establish goodwill. 
and we did that. We spent the day going around uh, to different places and, and distributing the stuff. The kids loved it. The teachers loved it. Um, and then on the way home or on the way back to our uh, camp, we got hit by an IED. Um, fortunately, no one was, was killed or injured. I think it just blew a tire out or, you know, exploded between two vehicles. But I remember thinking to myself, you know, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense. You know, here I am going out. We're going out of our way to raise additional money, you know, not even government money, but just personal charity to do, you know, do the right thing. We're, we're help. We're trying to help this community. And, and here's people from that community trying to kill us. <laughs> so, yeah. no, I mean, there were definitely moments where where you kind of step back and thought to yourself, you know, what what exactly are we doing over here again? You know, this isn't really a great way to show gratitude. Any ever a time in your training or while you were in the in the army at all where you regretted or questioned your decision to do it? No, not seriously. I mean, there were moments I'm sure where I was crawling through mud at ranger school or you know hungry or tired, where I imagined the life that I had once had <laughs> comfortably <laughs> living in Manhattan with you know going out to nice bars and restaurants. Um, so of course there were moments where where I, you know, I'd, I'd be like, wait a second, you know, how did I get myself into this mess? But, but, but seriously, no, I, I was proud to be doing what I was doing. I, I enjoyed doing what I was doing, even though it was tough. Um, you know, there were moments where I, I questioned if the mission was ever going to succeed or not, but I never questioned the decision to, 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 to serve. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, big props to you for what you did because you absolutely didn't have to. I mean, you left comfort. Yeah, I mean, I, I I did put you know a fair amount on the line, so I certainly didn't want to you know get down there and have something go wrong, and then you know I was pretty far out on a limb. So I guess to that extent there was some pressure, but I mean it was also tough just because I was you know I'd grown up in the suburbs, um, I was always a pretty good athlete, I was always fit, and I was always very competitive, but I had never been hunting in my life, I'd never been camping in my life, I'd never fired a weapon, I'd never set up a tent. You know, so you think about a lot of the, the the skills that come, you know, much more naturally to people from different backgrounds. A lot of that stuff was foreign to me and was was challenging. Um, so it wasn't easy, but but you know, I just kept reminding myself, you know what, just don't quit. Uh, put one foot in front of the other, and you know, things will fall into place. Yeah. So the, so your time was up, and you came home. How did you feel about your deployment? Uh, you know, did you feel like you'd made some progress, or what was the feeling? The, the feeling, honestly, the feeling in the immediate aftermath of the deployment was was pretty. Uh, uh, I don't want to say de- it wasn't depressing, but it, it was subdued because we we experienced a lot of casualties. You know, I, I would I think somewhere it sounds almost hard to believe, but somewhere in the neighborhood of you know over 150 wounded out of a 700 person battalion. Um, you know, that's a, that's a lot. Um, and at the time when we left, it was still pretty dangerous. We, it hadn't turned. Um, and it's, it's kind of amazing because I remember distinctly emailing, uh, my former Iraqi interpreter who stayed there with the next unit. And, um, and this was only like two months after we, we got back to Germany. And I emailed him and I just said, you know, how's it going? What, what's it like over there? And he said, you're not going to believe it, but you know, there are areas where, you know, we would have to shoot smoke grenades and, and run because of the sniper threat and the small arms threat, um, where now you could take off your body armor, sit down on the sidewalk and eat a kebab. You know, that's how secure it is. So it was almost night and day. Um, we, we certainly contributed to that turnaround, but we didn't, we weren't unfortunately there to witness it actually take place. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I guess you had a sense of accomplishment that at least, yeah. at least for some period of time, y'all had, y'all had, made good progress and, and, and yeah so we got we had that sense but it wasn't immediate it wasn't until we had gotten back for a few months and, and learned that things had changed um and so that was that was definitely gratifying well given what i know about you now and you you've written a book and or at least one have you written more than one book one book i'm okay. hoping to start a second one but just one so far okay so before we get into that and i know you've done some writing for or at least it's been picked up by the washington post and several uh-huh. big big um I guess, you know, organizations. I mean, did you keep good detailed notes while you were deployed? And did you always enjoy writing? I, I, I did. I was an English major in college. Uh, so I've always been a reader, you know, from as far back as I can remember. Um, 
and I've always enjoyed writing. I'd, I'd like to think that I've always been reasonably good at it. Um, I, d- I didn't take detailed notes with the objective of, of ever, you know, publishing anything based on my experience, but I did, um, you know, send pretty long, you know, emails home to, to family and friends. Um, almost, you know, maybe subconsciously as a bit of a diary or, you know, something to preserve these memories. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it wasn't like I was sitting down with the intention of, of writing about my experience, but I did try to capture some of these events because I knew that they were important and I didn't want to forget them. But I, I have read some of your articles and, of course, your book. And I wanted to ask you about the one where you talk about paid patriotism. Was that written specifically uh, for the Washington Post or did they just pick it up? Did you write it for someone else? No, that was for the Post. I, I kind of had this agreement with them where, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not on their staff, but I had like a freelance relationship with them where I can pitch them stories and then they're free to, you know, take them or leave them. Uh, and so that was one that, that I, I pitched uh, to them. Yeah, so we talk about that one and what it was about and, you know, what, why you started thinking about it. Um, yeah, I mean, that one. It, it, it was a few years ago, so unfortunately, it's not completely fresh in my mind, and I don't want to confuse it with the, you know, the anthem protest issue because that was not what it was about. This was, you know, a few years before that whole situation developed. Um, and from what I can recall, um, I was just trying to basically make the argument that uh, our society had become a little bit too enamored with, with, with symbolic. But but kind of superficial actions, um, you know, uh, like you see at at some of these sporting events. Um, There was a book called Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk that is an entire book kind of based on that premise, as opposed to citizens actually being engaged in uh, our foreign policy decisions and and knowing about uh, these wars that we're in and why we're in them or, or maybe why we shouldn't be in them and just being more actively engaged as opposed to. Uh, essentially being content to, you know, clap for a few minutes on, on, on Sunday afternoon, but then just go back to your life and forget all about the troops and forget all about veterans. Um, so I think that's what I was trying to get at. Yeah. You, and you talked about how, I guess the department of defense had paid, I don't know if it was teams or leagues or someone to maybe ha- have some of these happy reunions. Yeah. Yeah. I mean that, that there, uh, there, I, I know for a fact that the, that that they had paid the NFL in some instances, you know, money to sponsor some of these, um, uh, you know, pregame uh, ceremonies, which which seemed to me pretty ridiculous. You know, here you have a league that's full of millionaires and billionaires. <laughs> Why should tax money be encouraging them to do something patriotic? You know, they should be doing that on their own. Um, and then the reunions, you know, was something where. Um, and and I, I wanted to be sensitive about it because there's something that's very touching and moving about those reunions, and I don't want to downplay that. Um, but I, I I just felt that they sometimes presented the uh, a misleading image of of what these wars uh, result in, you know, because yes, there are some really beautiful reunions um, where you know a, a husband you know gets back and surprises his wife or proposes or. Uh, but for every one of those, there's some very heartbreaking things that happen too. And, you know, I, I just wanted to, to make sure that that didn't kind of get lost in, in all the hoopla. Yeah. Cause you were talking about, a you gave a specific example of a guy reunited with his wife and, and, and I guess it was a genuine, you know, reuniting situation. I, mean, I guess that's the first time they had seen each other uh-huh. and everybody cheers for a few minutes or a few seconds. And then, you know, it's forgotten and. They go on about the game and about about drinking and eating and but you said you know what about if he followed some of these casualty notification officers mm-hmm. to you know through this nice all American home a flag waving yeah across a manicured lawn and then to see the mother faint when she gets the news of her son mm-hmm. and and I know I mean this 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 is something that that must you know touch close to home. For, for you and, and with your, with your brother's loss and his uh, sacrifice. And, 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 and that really was my, my point, which is I have nothing against patriotism. And I think these, I think it's a great thing that, w- that we do honor our troops as, as, you know, as much as we can, whether it's at sporting events or anywhere else. What I was trying to say though, is that that shouldn't be the end of it. You know, we shouldn't go home, 
you know, or pick up our hot dog, drink our beer, and and forget about them for the next week or the next year. It should be something that is is a more prominent part of, of people's lives. And and to be a citizen in our country, I think it's it's imperative that that you do know what soldiers are doing abroad uh, in the name of our country, and that you weigh in on it, whether you know in favor of it or or if you think that they're being misused in some instances. But but just to be engaged, and the engagement should go further than you know ten minutes every Sunday afternoon. Yeah. Well, you may not know, but uh, you know, Lifetime had a a series called Coming Home. Mm -hmm. I think they did two seasons, and you know that had the kind of the forced, planned out reunions, and you know they tried to get all creative and uh, Uh and 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 I don't know if you knew this, but but our family was in one of those season one. Oh wow, I didn't know that. And and they featured it was about Mark, and um, he was one of the A stories. Of course, it was a different had to be a different format. Uh-huh. And um, you know, anyway, the the marine pilot who pitched it to him, the guys kept saying, "No, no, no, we can't do it. It's against our format." Well, he finally got him. I guess they finally listened to him, and they and they did it. And I guess that was the well, it was the only episode that dealt with a death uh-huh. uh, versus a happy reunion. So there was a reunion between our family and this pilot who was providing close air support for Mark. Uh-huh. When he was killed, but different kind of reunion. Uh-huh. So yeah, I mean, uh-huh. yeah, we saw some of the. The, the forced reunions, but you know, I, it was, it was, I think it was good to see, but then once you got season two in there, it's like, okay, you know, it's maybe enough now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's go on to your book. Uh, we're, cause we're, we're run, running out of time and I, and uh, the prisoner in his palace about Saddam Hussein, we, we talk about the, you know, really, I'm, I'm more curious why you wrote the book and how you were introduced or found out about the 12 you know, sure, quote, sure. Yeah. So um, I was introduced to it doing research for uh, a New York Times reporter at the time. This, and this is, you know, over 10 years ago. Um, and he had given me a number of uh, oral history interviews, which are interviews that the Army does with soldiers who took place or took uh, part in uh, historical events. And, you know, I got dozens of these, uh, uh, and most of them weren't particularly noteworthy. But this one group of them jumped out at me. Um, as just really remarkable. And they were interviews that were done with the soldiers who had guarded Saddam. And guarded's not even really the right word. I mean, they basically lived alongside him and cared for him in the months prior to his execution. And they discussed the relationships that developed over the course of this time. Um, and so ever since that moment, um, I thought to myself, you know, this is something that has got to be written about. I encouraged the, the guy I was working for to, to write about it in his book, but his book kind of had a different focus. And so he either wasn't interested in it or wasn't able to. Um, and so in the back of my mind, I thought to myself, this is a story that just has got to be written or it'll be lost forever. Um, fast forward a few years, I'm, work, I'm working at the Pentagon, or actually more than a few years, probably like you know five, five or so years. I, I went to grad school, then I went to work at the Pentagon. And I, I was still single at, at that time, and I thought to myself, you know what, if I don't take the plunge now, um, I, you know, my life's not going to get any simpler in the future. Um, and so uh, let's take a leap and, and, and write this thing. So I quit my job and uh, I approached uh, some people I knew in the publishing world and I asked them, you know, do you think this is something that has legs? Is this a story people will be interested in? And, you know, fortunately for me, the answer was, uh, was yes. There was so much about this book that just really – just intrigued me. I mean, well, first of all, I've been thinking about what am I going to even title this episode with you, Will? <laughs> I mean, because, I mean, Saddam was a germaphobe, we learn. Uh-huh. You know, I had no clue. <laughs> uh, you know, and he, and these guys, they got pretty close with him. Yeah, I mean, that that really is is what it was so remarkable about this. And, and I don't see the book really as, you know, um, a book even – necessarily about the Iraq war. It's certainly not a biography of Saddam. I see it as a, as like a psychological exploration of, of, I mean, I don't want to sound too, uh, over the top or or melodramatic, but uh, you know what it is to be human, you know, and, 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 and how humans, uh, you know, kind of the mystery of of human nature and, and how can it be that these young soldiers, you know, many of whom were just out of basic training, they weren't special operators, they weren't CIA uh, operatives. They were just, you know, kids. I think one of them was 18 years old. He'd been in basic training six months prior, and here he is sitting across from the world's most wanted dictator, 
um, who had, you know, the blood of, of thousands of innocents on his hands. And, and I don't overlook that in the book. I, 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 mm-hmm. I make it quite clear that, that Saddam was guilty of horrendous crimes. But I also try to bring him to life as, as a complicated human being who did have no shortage of, of charm and who, you know, despite themselves, a number of these soldiers actually began to, to kind of like. Yeah, I mean it. Uh, you know, and I and I would I don't wanna, I want to make it clear too uh, with the listeners is because I, I I was reading some reviews on the book and uh-huh. guy, when you know when of course who, I don't know how many said this but I, I read it <laughs> once. He's like, you know, uh, you 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 praise Saddam. Basically, he was said you were talking you were giving him too much credit, positive credit, and it's not no way and no way did you. I mean, you made it clear that this guy was evil, mm-hmm. and his sons were evil. I mean, it, it's just. It's crazy, and then uh, Chemical Ali was there in prison too, at least for a time. Mm-hmm. Well, well, and they were—I guess—they were guarding him as well. Is that right? He was held uh, nearby, but the, the the portion of the book that I focus on, it was just Saddam and these soldiers. Um, and and I, yeah, I do want to highlight uh, because you brought up a good point. You know that there hasn't been a lot of negative feedback, but but if there is a criticism that I've heard a few times, and I think oftentimes the criticism comes from people who haven't actually even read the book. They just kind of think think that they understand the book. But you know, that it's that it paints too, you know, sympathetic a portrait of Saddam. And I actually mentioned that I was talking to one of the soldiers after the fact, and I think he had read the same review. Um and he was furious because he said, Listen, that makes us sound bad too. And he's like, if you know if they have a problem with the way Saddam is depicted that's not you, the writer. This isn't a novel. You didn't invent that that character. He's like, if they have a problem with it, they have a problem with reality because all you did was it was explain what really happened. You know, so so if there's a critique, it shouldn't be a critique of the book. It's a critique of of just of of life. You know, so yeah. I think it's important that that you highlight that, and I think it's also important to to recognize that you know these soldiers, even though they came to enjoy his company. They kind of knew – they knew he was guilty, and they knew that he pretty much deserved to die. Um, but it didn't make it any easier for him, and, and I think that gets at the fact that this mission was, was unique. You know, It's one thing to, to engage in kind of conventional combat where you shoot at a target that's 200 meters away. It's probably someone you've never seen before. You're never going to see him again. And I'm not, that's not, I'm not suggesting that's easy, but it's a whole different situation to live with someone every day, to watch them – bathe, to watch them pray, to watch them eat, to talk to them, to learn about their family, to joke with them, and then play a role in that death. Um, it, it's, a, it's a whole different mission psychologically, which is, which is, I think, why it was tough on these guys, even though they knew he was a bad guy. Yeah, I mean, they're sitting here talking about their families with him. He's asking them about their their families, and he's talking about his sons. Uh-huh. And, uh, you know, and, and there's one part, point in the book where you kind of make the point. It's like, uh, did, his, his, did Saddam, was he just delirious? Did he understand how evil his sons were? Or did he just, maybe he just wasn't, you know, he just didn't want to talk about them that way. But, um, yeah, I mean, they, they, they got to know each other pretty well. Yeah, and, you know, another question that the book raises, and, and I don't answer it. You know, I kind of leave it to the reader to, to connect the dots. And I think that there are a number of of valid answers, but it raises the question, to what extent was this just a big, you know, manipulation? Was was Saddam essentially just a sociopath who was using these guys to get, you know, a better life in, in prison? You know, um, in, in reality, he really didn't, it wasn't that great. So if that was his goal, you know, it, it, it's arguable how successful it was. But, you know, you could say this was just an effort to manipulate and it wasn't sincere. Or you could say that no, this, there was the, a very peculiar and improbable, genuine relationship that developed between these these guys, or you know a third option would be it's a little of each. You know maybe he started out with the intention of of uh, you know seducing them and manipulating them, and then he kind of over time grew to like them, and they grew to you know enjoy his company. So I don't think we'll ever know the answer to that question, and I don't I intentionally don't try to answer it i just try to tell the story and i think a smart reader can could emerge from the book with any of those three uh conclusions and be justified in in doing so yeah i mean it's funny how he had these outbursts sometimes in court Uh uh-huh and you know going off on the americans and then you know (laughs) then he's back back in the back and he's just you know chatting up with them like he loves them 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's one episode where he's screaming, you know, death to America, and he's waving and shouting in the courtroom, and then he gets in the elevator with the soldier, and he's like, hey, don't listen to that. He's like, I just had to, do, you know, it's just for, it's it's theater. He's like, you, know, you guys know I love you, you know. So he could turn it on and off, you know, uh, you know, uh, relatively easily. Yeah. And, you know, some of these guys are driving around Baghdad at night looking for cigars for Saddam. And, you know, they were, and they were, weren't they saying to themselves, like, wow, if, if people, if my friends and family only knew what I'm doing at this very moment. Yeah. And, and even the people that they're passing, like, even if they see other U.S. military around or coalition forces, and, you know, those people had no clue either what they were doing. Yeah. I mean, they were sworn to secrecy uh, for security reasons. You know, they couldn't be telling other Americans and, and they couldn't get on the phone and, and tell their loved ones back home. And you can imagine how tough that would be. You know, for at least myself, like if I was sitting across from Saddam Hussein, I would want to tell someone about it. And, yeah. and, and and they were and they were basically they'd have to just invent a cover story. And, you know, their parents or their girlfriend, they'd say, oh, yeah, you know, we're pulling guard duty. We sit in a guard tower all day. It's pretty boring. You know, when in reality they were spending, tw- you know, 12 hours a day across from, you know, the most wanted villain in, in you know, in, in 50 years. Yeah, so what they also couldn't write about it. They couldn't keep a journal, right? Yeah, true. Yeah, they couldn't keep a journal. They couldn't email about it. They couldn't call about it. Um, and, and I think that was tough on them, you know, because it, you know you 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 take into consideration that they're doing this very psychologically demanding mission, and then there's no one they can tell about it, you know, except each other, um, which which I think just compounded the the the, the challenge of the whole situation. Well, there's two things I wanted to point out in the book before we wrap up, Will, or, or two things that stood out to uh-huh. me. One of them was um, Saddam was telling one of the guards, I forgot which one, I don't know if it's Hutch or who, but how he had gotten mad one time with Uday and like set his expensive cars on fire. Uh-huh. And, and the, the background is, I guess Uday and Saddam's brother had gotten in an argument over some, you know, these guys are brutal. Yeah. I mean, and the book has some graphic scenes in it. Uh-huh. And, uh... They, I guess they were, had argued, were arguing over a girl, and then Uday gets mad, starts shooting in a crowd. He, I think he killed some people. He shot Saddam's, bro, Saddam's brother in the leg, and is that what happened? And then Saddam, he's furious, and so he sets his cars on fire. Yeah, I mean, you you can't make. I mean, this stuff is <laughs> like right out of the movie Scarface, you know, or Goodfellas, or you know, Sopranos. You you, you name it. I mean, the I don't know if you're familiar with the movie Scarface but that that final scene where you know Tony Montana's in that in his mansion and the all the the enemies start climbing over the fence and there's this just this completely over the top shootout I mean that's the kind of stuff that was happening in Baghdad under Saddam normally I mean there were there was another scene in the book where um his sons-in-law come back to uh Baghdad from Jordan where they had defected um with his daughters and he had, you know, felt like he had to punish them for their betrayal. And so there's this shootout that lasts like 12 hours right downtown, you know, thousands of rounds of ammunition, RPGs, you know, automatic weapons. Um, and I mean, it's the kind of stuff, if you saw it in a movie, you would never believe it. But in this sort of nightmare world, uh, that he presided over, it was, you know, not uncommon. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah he had told his sons in law that he said, do you think I could really kill the, the, the yep. father of my grandchildren. <laughs> yep, and then they last, and the Jordanians that they were with warned them. They 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 said, "Listen, if you guys go back to Iraq, you're not going to make it a week." And they were right. And they, I think the Jordanians actually took bets uh, on how many days it would be before they were killed, and it was like two, I think. Is <laughs> yeah, because he was basically they were met at the border, weren't they? Coming back. Yep, yep. They 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 had they had fled to Jordan in, while they were in Jordan. They were debriefed by, you know, intelligence agencies from around the world, including the CIA. Saddam knew this. Saddam knew that he was talking, they were talking to, to these uh, Westerners. And uh, so the Jordanians said, listen, you know, if you guys go back, he will not forgive you. Um, for whatever delusional reason, they, they proceeded to go back. They were met by helicopters at the Iraqi Jordanian border. Um, it was another one of these. I mean, it's it's a scene like right out of one of those movies uh, where I think Uday got off the helicopter with a big cigar in his mouth. They put the, the Saddam's daughters in one helicopter and they put the, the sons-in-law in the other. And when the Jordanians saw that, they said, well, I wouldn't want to be in that. I definitely wouldn't yeah. want to be in that one helicopter because we know that's not going to end well. And his daughters still loved him 
And yeah, I mean, you can't make that up either. He kills her husband, and she was, you know, loyal to him till the end, and was responsible for putting together care packages to send him when he was in prison. Yeah. You know, the last thing is, would you will you elaborate on the some of the guys, the Americans, the twelve? They felt some guilt, you know, after Saddam was was hanged and and his body was, I guess, brought out in public and some people started, um, I don't know, you know, they were mutilating it or, or, you know, beating on him, I guess, kicking him and whatever they were doing. And some of the the 12 kind of felt guilty. Yeah, and it it wasn't guilt over what they were doing. It was was just they felt bad about what was happening. And again, this this wasn't that. You know, they didn't feel bad that he had been executed. I think most of them mm-hmm. recognized that that was deserved. But they had been – they had basically spent the last four months trying to do this with, with a sense of dignity and professionalism. You know, and their whole mission was to make sure that, that he got through his days, you know, securely and safely and so that this trial could proceed and, you know, justice could, could occur. And they did that. And, and there was a recognition, you know, you, you can't even let this guy – trip in the shower and get a black eye because if we go on TV around the world and Saddam is in court with a black eye, everyone's going to assume that the Americans abused him. So it was a priority of theirs to, 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 to conduct themselves, uh, you know, in a, in a, in a professional manner and to, to do this, this mission, uh, uh, you know, as responsibly as possible. And, and, you know, what bothered them was the minute that they turned him over to the Iraqis, Everything went to hell. You know, the ex- the execution itself was a mess. You can watch it on YouTube. You know, it looks like just an undisciplined mob. Saddam looks like the most dignified guy there, which is, you know, unfortunate. Mm-hmm. Um, and then after it happens, you know, the body is is is, is sort of desecrated, and it, it, and it's just a wild, frenzied celebration. And they, and they thought to themselves, you know, this is exactly what we came here to fix. You know, that we we wanted something better for this society and it's all going to hell right before our eyes. So that, that's what they had a tough time dealing with. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for, for explaining that. And one guy, one of the Americans got a pretty cool gift from Saddam right before he was executed. <laughs> yeah. I felt bad. Like I, I still am, you know, a little nervous about revealing that because I don't want to get him in, in trouble. And, and, uh, uh, but yeah, he, it was the, the night of the execution and they were in there and, and had given him word that he needs to get ready to, to go to the gallows. And so he was gathering his, you know, his belongings and, and making his last preparations. And he pulled over one of the guards and, uh, literally grabbed him by the arm and took his watch off, a very expensive foreign watch and put it on this guy's arm and just said, I want you to have this, uh, because I'm thankful for how you've treated me. Um, and the soldier didn't initially want to take it because he knew there's probably some army rule against that. But at the same time, uh, you know, it was a pretty stressful time and he just didn't want to derail this, <laughs> this mission that they were yeah. on. Yeah. Uh, so he said, you know what? I'll just, it's not the time to put up a fight. I'll deal with it later. So he, he, he took the watch. Uh, it's a, a pretty remarkable. I, I did, putting myself in Saddam's shoes. I can't imagine having, soldiers bringing me to my execution and then giving them a gift before they do it. It's pretty mm-hmm. remarkable. Will, in closing, what else would you like to say either about your book or anything else or, you know, upcoming book or you know, projects? Um, well, I, I, I'm right now working with my editor to, to uh, identify a topic for the second one. I think we have a few promising candidates in the in the next month or two. Uh, hopefully we'll, we'll arrive at one. Uh, so it's a little premature now to give you any more on that, but hopefully there, I will have some more information here in the not too distant future. So you're saying it's going to be a nonfiction? It will be nonfiction. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be military related or if it's going to be something here, you know, in America. Um, uh, but, uh, but yeah, we'll, I'm going to at least try to use the same kind of writing style that I, I used in this one and, and, and use some of the same storytelling, uh, techniques. Um, but no, that's it. And, you know, I just wanted to thank you for, for having me and, and obviously thank, you know, your family for, for your sacrifices, which go beyond anything that, that I've done. So, um, you know, I'm humbled to, to, to talk to you. Well, I really appreciate you being on. And, and by the way, uh, the book is so easy to read. I love the short chapters. That's very important to me. Mm-hmm. And, and it kind of kind of goes back and forth as well. So it's a great read, The Prisoner in His Palace. I'll have links to it. Awesome. And um, I'm guessing, or is there a, a preferred 
location that you like to send people to or just anywhere that, you know, you get books? Um, I mean, I'm always a big fan of supporting local bookstores, but at the same time, the unfortunate reality is that you can usually get it on Amazon for about $10 cheaper than at a bookstore. <laughs> so, you know, if you have a nice bookstore in your town, by all means, um, you know, support them. But uh, if you just want to get it for a few less dollars, I'd say, you know, go, go to Amazon. <laughs> okay, great. Do you ever come down to the southeast? Uh, every once in a while, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, are you through doing your you know, book tours, and are you, or are you still doing a little bit of that across the country? No, we're done. Um, I, 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 well, no, I shouldn't say that. We may have, there's going to be one or two events here in the not-too-distant future, but for the most part, most of that's finished. There's actually an article that I'll refer you to. You might want to take a look at the, the most recent event I had was at uh, San Quentin Prison, of all places. And I spoke to some prisoners there about my book, and it was a pretty amazing experience. So uh, that was in Newsweek, and you can find it online. But uh, that, when it comes to book tours, that, that one kind of blew me away. Good. I'll find that and <laughs> put it in the show notes. If I can't find it, I'll, I'll ask you. But okay. I'm sure I'll be able to, to locate that pretty easy tonight. Okay. Well, thank you. I've really enjoyed this, Will, and I, I really enjoyed your book and also appreciate you serving, you know, and just, just, man, doing what you did. That's a you know, great example and you're, you're a great patriot. And so, so thank you, sir. No, thank you. And I mean, honestly, compared to, I've seen some of the other folks you've had on and, and what I did, you know, is, uh, pales in comparison to, to a lot of them. So I'm, I'm humbled to be on the show, but I'm, I'm glad, uh, to talk to you and I enjoyed it. Same here.